in the lake. Blowing up. It's taking off. It was uh, before we had what troves, and that seemed to be the biggest draw in Central Pennsylvania. Now it seems every other day we have another one popping up, and they're all quality. We're lucky now. We have you know so many local like troves, and Pizza Boy, and now Zero Day. It's pretty awesome. It's a good time to be drinking craft beer. So. What I'm most excited about is we have so much great beer here in Harrisburg. And that is, we're, we're hitting a critical mass, which is so much fun. Craft beer is uh, the new American Revolution. It's, it's honestly uh, the revitalization of the blue collar worker. Uh, well, craft beer, to me, it's, it's fresher. It, it's, uh, it's got a uniqueness about it that it was made recently as opposed to uh, the big corporation beers. I just really appreciate the fact that it actually has flavor versus just the regular crap that's out there. Much crisper taste, much more full flavor. It's wonderful. Why do you like crap brews? Uh, they taste delicious. Uh, I love the culture. And um, they make me feel good. It builds a sense of culture, community, too. Like a lot, I would say half these people here you probably are related to. <laughs> or no. Yeah. Craft beer kind of brings people together. You tell me when. All right, when? I like craft beer because I like surprises. By the turn of the 20th century, America was very, well, drunk, with nearly 2,000 small breweries serving the nation's thirsty. Like many other small towns at the time, our capital city of Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, was home to several small breweries and brew pubs, churning out fresh beer to its locals. Two of the most popular breweries of the time were Fink's Keystone Brewery on Forster Street and Groppner's on Market Street. Fink's, located where the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board now sits, was part of the famous Four Corners, where it was said a man could find everything he needed in life. Grappner's, though it doesn't have a story to tell, outlasted both Prohibition and every other brewery in the area, until it too closed in 1951. For nearly half a century, Harrisburg was without a brewery to call its own. Then, in the late 1990s, two new breweries emerged in the Berg and proved serious staying power, Appalachian Brewing Company and Trogues Brewing Company. Today, nearly 20 years later, the greater Harrisburg area is home to more than 30 craft breweries and countless beer bars within a 30 mile radius. When I first came to Harrisburg, I saw a lot of untapped market, so to speak. Uh, you know, every bar you would go to had Yingling, Miller, Bud, Coors, you know, and that was about it. So I saw, you know, coming from Colorado where we had uh, tons of craft beer on tap everywhere, uh, that there was a, a, a good upside potential for this area. And I think um, still in this, in, in a lot in this region, there's still a lot of untapped, uh, I hate to keep using that, that uh, but uh, still a lot of uh, potential for, uh, for growth in the craft beer market. We were living in Colorado at the time and uh, had written our original business plan to do it in, in Colorado. And the more and more we kind of looked at it, we realized it pointed more to coming back home, learning what we, taking what we learned in Colorado and coming back home because we had a lot of friends and family in the area. Um, we also thought about it just logistically from a distribution standpoint. We have so many great cities that are in a two hour drive from, from central PA. So we just thought it made more business sense to come back, come back to Pennsylvania and start, start Trogues. We had a sense of home field advantage at that point as well, knowing the area so well and, and knowing the, the people in the area embrace local businesses. Um, we were hoping that would play into it, and, and it did. We always wanted to be in the city of Harrisburg. Uh, the kind of overall feeling of our brand was city culture and we wanted the walkability, the bikeability and we looked at the neighborhoods in the city of Harrisburg and fell in love with Midtown um, before we found any viable options for our facility because there are not a lot. Um, 
and it always just kind of felt like home. We actually, we decided, okay, we're opening a brewery in Midtown. And then we said, where okay, we okay where are we going to put it? Um, <laughs> so, yeah, we, we chose the community before we actually found the space. I think that what we do have is a really cool community of professional brewers, home brewers, and excited customers that make this work. And it really makes Harrisburg unique. I'll do the countdown. We'll do it from three, two, one, and then we'll cut the ribbon, and then you will officially be open, and all these folks are going to swarm in, which is why you're here. Okay. <laughs> are we ready? Ready. Three, two, one. Zero. Yes! Woo! I first got into brewing uh, because I lived next to a fellow who had a friend who was a home brewer. He turned me on to his home brew and I just fell in love with it right away and I, and I thought why am I drinking uh, all these other commercially available beers. Uh, I was really intrigued by what I tasted, I really liked it and I wanted to know how to make it myself. And that started just a beautiful phase of my life where I began home brewing and um, it, just, it just took off from there. When I moved out to Colorado, my first apartment right around the corner was a local homebrew shop. So I think that definitely piqued my curiosity. Started very small with kind of just extract kits and had been talking to John quite a bit about, you know, what was going on in Colorado. And I think that kind of piqued his interest. And rather than starting from a homebrewing scale, John ended up jumping right in, working with a small brew pub really cleaning their tanks and... I walked in one day when their handmade bottling line happened to spring a leak. So there's beer all over the wall and all over the floor and cha literally changed my shirt and started working. And in six months I was managing the brew pub. I started home brewing in 1993 and uh, within a year I had my first job as a head brewer at uh, Jackie O's in Athens, Ohio. Actually, from 94 to 96, I actually built Jackie O's. Like most other home brewers, I bought a five gallon bucket as a fermenter and the first, you know, extract kit. Made a batch of beer and our families, you know, really liked it. Our friends said it was great. And I was instantly hooked at that point. I mean, from that day, I knew I was gonna have a brewery. I'm from the Netherlands. I'm used to drinking a whole bunch of Belgian beers. And you could only get old ones here, and they would charge you $120 to $150 a case for the same beers that I used to be able to get for about six bucks a six pack. So I decided to do my own, uh, brew my own Belgian beers. I'm ashamed to say that I, I didn't dream of making beer my whole life. I never home brewed a batch of beer in my life. Uh, hopefully you're not taping this. <laughs> well, I started as a home brewer. You know, it, it was one of those things where uh, I was in school and I, uh, it was a hobby of mine. Um, I actually uh, remember in eighth grade, I, I st stole some grape concentrate out of my freezer in some gallon jugs, put it in there with some yeast because I saw, a, uh, I think I read a book or something about <laughs> fermentation. <laughs> So I, I made my first batch of wine, and it was absolutely terrible. Um, a few weeks after my wedding, my wife took me to um, a homebrew store in a garage where they were also making motorcycles. Um, got my first kit. Um, I made my first beer. It was terrible. I threw it away. It tasted like soap. My father was really in the winemaking uh, several years ago, and I went to a uh, homebrew shop uh, Mr. Steve's and um, when I was there I started looking at the homebrew equipment supplies and I thought you know hey maybe I should try my hand at this and went home that Christmas I had given him his gift of winemaking supplies and he had just bought a whole bunch of uh, homebrewing equipment and uh, I took it from him. <laughs> I got a kit on Groupon that came with like two plastic buckets of recipe box that you poured into a thing on your stovetop and then you added yeast and stuck it in the corner of a room. And I think that's what the instructions said. Stick it in a corner of a room. <laughs> like three weeks later, we were trying and we're like, this, 
this is terrible. <laughs> the failure actually only drove me to invest more time and effort into making it right because I saw the possibilities. I was like, there, there's alcohol in this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> The brewery community is, is really helpful and they're just so wonderful and nice. Um, when we first started, Al Kaminsky just got right on us on Facebook and said, hey, as soon as you get a beer out there, guys, I want to support you, you're local, bring it on over. Not even asking like, what do you got, what kind, what are you thinking of, just bring it over, I'll take it, you know, and I'll help you out. Um, he, he was involved in getting other brewers locally to do a combination beer, a collaboration. Trogues would always say, if you need help with yeast, if you need help with grain, whatever you need, you know, just give us a call, we'll treat, see if we can help you, as well as Artie from ABC. It was just really kind of a family. It's actually kind of humbling to talk to some of these brewers that I've had the great fortune to talk to over the last year, uh, just because of the, the passion and the heart they put into what they brew. Um, you know, they're part artist, part scientist, and you can tell they really care a lot. Uh, it's unlike any other industry I've ever been a part of. Generally speaking, the beer community is very um, cooperative. Everybody does collaboration brews. There's, there's always that stuff going on. Um, you know, you hear the stories about, hey, we ran out of kegs this month, or, you know, for this batch, we really need a couple kegs. Can you, can you loan us a few? And, I mean, that, that happens. You know, pe brewers do that. You know, that's the type of thing that people do in the brewing community. What other industry do you have where you could go call a competing business up and say, hey, I'm out of Centennial Hops, do you have any? Uh, and they'll give it to you freely. Craft beer in general is very unique where it's a brotherhood. It's us against the big guys. Um, so everybody's in it together. It's just awesome to be in, be in the craft beer industry like that. We love the enthusiasm because that's where we were. Uh, we've, we've all started having to brew, bottle, filter, and then go sell beer at night. One thing that we embraced was there was a couple of local breweries that helped us out and gave us a view into maybe issues we were having at the time. So we're, we're trying to pay it back and, and do the exact same thing. So we invite any local breweries starting up to come in and share our lab or see what we're doing and kind of share information. The best part about it too is how helpful everybody's been. Um, I was a home brewer. This is my first pro gig. I'm kind of figuring it out as I go. Um, everybody's been super helpful. If you need anything, you can call any one of them and ask for anything and they'll always be there for you. Uh, unlike a lot of other industries, we really work together because we realize that we're in the same game together. And as long as we're uh, one successful, the others will follow. I'm a pizza guy by trait, obviously. I'm Pizza Boy Brewing. Uh, I've been working in the pizza industry since I was 13. If you, if you call another pizza shop at any time of the week and say, Hey man, listen, I, Giuseppe, I ran out of pepperoni. Can you loan me pepperoni? You're gonna get like a, hey, go, you know, a bunch of Italian <laughs> curses and not in most businesses, in any business, someone that has another business around you normally does not extend any kind of hand. But when you get the hand extended to you by numerous people, you do the same for the next person. So if anyone ever calls me and asks me a question about anything or needs anything, I make sure that I'm right there to help them. The fact that the brewers and, and the home brewers and the store owners are so willing to help, it really creates the sense of culture. She always says it's, it's community, it's not competition. Yeah. Um, because really, the more breweries that are in a single uh, area, it's only better for the area. Yeah. In the collaborative nature of craft beer, um, Everyone plays together nicely in the sandbox and makes sure that, you know, that, you know, there's enough for everyone to go around. There's a nice camaraderie um, in the craft market and it's kind of like us versus big beer, really. Um, so granted, yes, there are a limited amount of tap handles, there's a limited amount of space, but at the end of the day, we're all drinking a beer together and having a great time. I think that the reason that craft beer is becoming as popular as it is, if you look at it, the food movement and the craft beer movement kind of were hand in hand. They kind of started at the same time. And, and I think it's an appreciation for the craft. 
I think uh, a lot of craft products in general are, are growing in popularity. People seem to want to get away from the mass-produced, maybe made in other countries sort of items and have an individual experience, have a more personal experience, one that's done with a lot of thought and care and take the time to appreciate it, sort of slow down. Um, so I think the craft beer sort of fits in with the rest of sort of a shifting culture a little bit. People are starting to get more interested, not just in beer, but in food as well, and their own local cultures. Um, with good beer, usually comes good food as well. People are, are starting to explore unique ingredients. So there's a lot of exploration happening as a culture as a whole right now, and with that, craft beer is coming along with it. There's just more interest in where things are made, how things are made, who's making it. Story um, behind it. Story behind it. The reason for it. The asking why. A lot of us small guys who started out with very basic knowledge, very basic brewing systems, have been educated and educated ourselves and have just grown. And uh, so the quality, I feel, has just gotten a lot better and more, more refined. I think the people have spoken. I think that people, uh, the folks are, are starting to taste um, delicious beer. They're starting to realize that um, they can support their local brewery, they can, they can support um, local business. I think sometimes local is kind of like rooting for your home team. Yeah. And I, I think there's something to say from knowing the guy who made your beer. I think that makes a huge difference. A lot of people now are into local, local restaurants that use local ingredients. Well, what better to go with that than a beer that's brewed locally. That whole like farm to table kind of movement, I think that kind of is happening with a lot of the local breweries. You want to get the beer as fresh as possible and you want to get it in your local environment so you know you're contributing money to the community. I think it's getting, it's getting so big and continuing to grow because there's so much information out there. People are becoming more educated. They're learning what's actually going into their beer. You know, somebody that might have drank a, a light American lager their whole lives, you know, when they try a light craft beer, they realize that there's a lot of love went into that. You know, the brewers put their heart and soul into what they're doing. And I think they want, they want a quality product. You know, people are over the, the fast food and, and the macro beer stuff. I think people for many years were ignorant of what beer could be because they were only offered a certain amount of, uh, of product, a certain type of product. And over the years, as micro, the microbrew revolution uh, began to take hold in the mid to late 80s and then throughout the early 90s, um, there were, uh, I think, uh, epiphanies to be had by those who enjoyed uh, beer. And they began to realize that, you know, what we were drinking really wasn't what beer was for a long time. I think beer is a bridge for communication and not necessarily like-minded communication. It opens up discussions and it fuels just this really great social revitalization that we need. I really think social media has a lot to do with it too. Yeah. Um, it's a lot of sharing and everything we do now is social, including drinking, and you don't even have to be in the same room with somebody to make drinking your beer social. And it's, it's a lot easier to find new and interesting things. People realize now that it's not just yingling lager out there as an alternative. I think people realize now that there's more beer out there than just the average American swill. You know, people are just tired of, you know, the yellow fizzy stuff, I think. And craft beer is just, great tasting beer, it, just period. For five or six dollars, you can treat yourself to something that you love at the end of the day or at the beginning of the day. In almost every recipe, doesn't add a lot of flavor to those recipes, doesn't add a lot of color to those recipes. It's really just there to produce fermentable sugars to make the beer, right? Uh, this actually comes to us from the American West. Not a lot of flavor to this product, but very handy in all those recipes. You know, back in the day when I got started, the biggest part of our job was really education. You know, I mean, educating ourselves to be better beer drinkers and better beer brewers, but, but educating the public as to exactly what the hell we were doing, you know? And, and uh, all those years of, of hardcore, you know, education and, you know, not, not beating it into people, but, but, you know, really letting people understand come to understand the process and, and 
what it means for beer, how, how freshness matters and, and, you know, supporting your communities and, and everything, you know, it, all those years of education finally paid off. And, you know, now craft beer is not a, not a weird little like hobby on the side. It's, it's, it has gone mainstream. People understand what people know, you know, whales more than they know Miller Lite now. Now that the, the local palate is changing and people are looking for those good craft beers and they're deciding on the styles that they like, now they need to educate themselves a little bit more on what they're drinking, where they're getting it, and how it's coming to them. You know, I could have had, I could have made room for 50 beers on tap here, but I wanted to have, you know, 20, 16 to 20 that were fresh, clean, and that we were going through at least a half barrel a week. So I never had to worry about anything being old. So I knew no matter who came in the door, they had a draft here. The, the beer lines were clean this week and that beer was gonna be fresh. That's one of the reasons we're not in seven states or 10 states or half the United States. Uh, you know, I want my beer to be consumed fresh. I want it to taste in your house like it tastes in my pub. I want it to taste in my pub like it tastes in Germany and, and in Munich and, and in England and Ireland. And now I know because I drink fresh beer all the time and as people learn it, you get that flavor and you, you, you get those little intricacies that are so much better than a beer that is, is set on a, uh, a dock or a container for way too long. And I believe that beer should be consumed where it's made, right here in, in Harrisburg and in the other areas of Pennsylvania as well. So instead of doing a beer event and getting people, you know, we're all gonna have beers and have a good time, but I'm gonna take people through the way that we pour beers here, the size line we use, the type of line we use, the temperature at which the cooler's at, uh, things that people don't think about that affect the beer. Because at the end of the day, I wanna see good beer out there. I wanna go out to eat at other places and I wanna, I wanna drink good beer. That's the bottom line. What's your favorite style of beer? I am truly an equal opportunity drinker, so I love dark, heavy stouts. I love something lighter and refreshing. It's all about my mood and it's all about season and what's available. So I love to explore. What's your favorite styles of beer these days? I feel like single hop ales, that's what I'm really into uh, right now. IPAs, I'm not played out yet, but as my wife will tell you, over the winter, stouts, I couldn't get enough of them. So I'm trying to wean myself off the stouts before summer comes. I'm a big fan of Liquid Hero down in New York. Um, anything that Pizza Boy does, obviously. IPAs are definitely something that I've probably been the most taken with, um, especially ones that are got a grapefruit flavor to them. That's definitely something that I seek out. Um, I've also lately kind of come around to stouts. It was not something that I really liked before, but I think a lot of the, the aging that they're doing with bourbon barrels and that sort of thing has really made me uh, like them. Trogues is an easy pick locally. Um, been going to them for a while and always interested to see what they're creating and their new scratches and the styles and of course very excited about Zero Day uh, finally being open and getting to to taste more of what Theo's doing and, and putting out there for everybody. The microbrew customer isn't necessarily style specific and that's something that the big breweries don't quite get I don't think. They, they want you to drink Budweiser or Miller and uh, those types of beers and only those types of beers. We want you to try different beers. Maybe buy a case of our beer one week, buy a case of the other beer the next week. And um, you know, as long as you get into that variety, you're gonna find that one beer that you like and you might buy that more often, but you will also try some other things. So that's for us, uh, the education of those consumers and also providing them with as much diversity as possible really I think can drive the market for us. Most people that are into craft beer you know, they might have an allegiance to one or two breweries, but they really want to try everything at least once. 
you have your folks that are looking looking for the craft beers that they know, the, the ballast points and the Brooklyn breweries and the dogfish heads and things like that because they know it. But the best part about those people is that if, if you talk to them, it doesn't take much to, to convince them to try Liquid Hero <laughs> um, or Milbach. There's a lot of name recognition, just like it was 20 years ago. People thought Absolute was the best vodka out there because they had all the advertising. So if they've heard the name, they want to try it. Um, but they also always want something different. So that's always the challenge too, and that's a big challenge for the brewers. They always have to be coming up with new products. Breweries have to make different beers, um, and, and, and they have to be on the top of their game. It's not just you know, making, what, making a beer that you're good at. You gotta be comfortable with making beers you're not necessarily uh, good at making or you know, wanna make you know, pumpkin beers. I mean, everybody wants a pumpkin beer. You know, not only do our customers challenge us to, to, to make these beers, our staff challenges us, and then also we go to the small breweries and we make them, and then you never know what's gonna happen. It could be a flop, or it could be that next beer that, that you have to put into a package. With craft beer, there's so many different beers being released. I mean, people like Trogues with their Scratch series and, you know, Pizza Boy brewing 50 different types of beer. There's just always something new to try, and I think p people really enjoy that. Like it's kind of the, the hunt or the search for the next best thing. Yeah, it's fun to try something new, something different. I just look for whatever is new on tap. I like to try breweries that I like if I've had a good track record with them, especially if they're local and all of a sudden there's something new on, I will definitely pursue that. Your typical craft beer drinker today doesn't want the same beer over and over and over again. They want variety, they want to try different things. I mean, apps like Untap, I hate to say it, but it's a game to some people where they can you know, get as many badges and as, as many check-ins as they can. The app Untapped is pretty much like totally ruined me, you know. I gotta try something new like every time I go somewhere. Thousands of beers available at your fingertips now and it's kind of overwhelming but exciting too to try to, to drink them all. <laughs>
um, also allows a personal connection between the farmer and the brewer and even the customer. We try and locally source whatever we possibly can. We, in our brew pubs and whatnot, we use a lot of farmers that are local, um, a lot of ingredients. Um, for instance, we're coming out with um, you know, a cherry goza style. We try and source syrups and cherries and any kind of those ingredients, we definitely try to source within this you know, Pennsylvania region. I try and use as many as I can. It's a little bit difficult. The, the ancillary business of craft brewing, malting and, and growing hops and whatnot, is still relatively new, so it's hard to get consistent quality ingredients you know, at a, at a, I hate to say it, but at a competitive price, you know, so, so we, we have to be very choosy in what we do, but we use what we can when we can get it. We've always tried to source close to home, but for beer ingredients, that's kind of been a challenge that usually means you're buying from the U.S. And I think now what we're seeing is because a lot of the breweries, we're seeing more and more malt growers opening up and uh, we have one in Pennsylvania now. We have hop farms starting to, to grow hops locally. And then you're seeing a lot of brewers starting to use um, more non-traditional ingredients from their local orchards. We use uh, local fruit, um, coffee, um, all kinds of stuff local. I just spent uh, a couple days this week talking to um, somebody from Philadelphia, a, a Pennsylvania maltster, so I'm, I'm going to probably do a batch uh, with some, some Pennsylvania grain. Um, we uh, are growing stuff on site here. We're on a 40-acre farm, so we're growing um, fruits and vegetables and everything. Uh, we're going to have hops this year also uh, that we're going to incorporate into some beers. Hops are important, obviously, in beer. And uh, there's a lot of things technically that you need to know, you know, uh, the acid content of the hops in order to, to do your recipe calculation correctly. You know, a lot of the hop growers in the area are, are starting to do that stuff now. I mean, it's costly for them to do, and they're making a commitment. And I think once they start doing that, I think you're going to start seeing a lot more breweries start, start utilizing their stuff on, on, on a larger scale. We try and do as much local stuff as we can. Um, there's actually a, a malting company, a maltster, that's looking to open up here that we're going to be doing uh, an all-local ingredient beer with. So whatever we can do to support the local, the local economy, we do. As these smaller breweries grow, they have needs and we have wants as well. We want to have a local maltster. I don't really love to buy my, my malt from Canada or, or the, the, uh, the northern part of the United States. If we could do it local, we can keep that money local, we can keep it all local, and uh, keep supporting this area in terms of uh, brewing and brewing production. Craft beer and breweries bring more people to um, certain areas in general. Um, it's been researched, there's lots of stuff online about it too. So when people actually look back and say, you know, we started 19 years ago in Downingtown, we had a brew pub when we first started. Since then, in 19 years, there's literally 25 to 30 more restaurants, all supporting Victory Beer as well on tap and all working together. Craft beer equals more money in everyone's pocket. We're a big tourism region to begin with, and uh, when people have an opportunity to go to unique places like the microbreweries and, and the facilities uh, like Appalachia and Troggs, I think it contributes to the, the whole uh, th that we are as a tourism destination. I think we're like the third largest tourism destination in the state of Pennsylvania. You know, the craft beers that we have here, that's just another reason to stop here and visit. And they're going to have to spend the night if they're in here drinking craft beer. The Commonwealth has about a hundred craft breweries in the state and in 2012 the economic impact of those breweries was two billion dollars. But what these breweries do is they come into these small towns, third class cities, take an old building, completely renovate it. You know, it's a fun place to be, it adds to the culture, and it basically revitalizes a uh, small town. We're a small business, so supporting the local breweries is very important to me uh, for that reason, because we are the same as they are. Even though they're a brewery and we're a restaurant, it doesn't really matter. We're still a small business in central Pennsylvania. I'm excited about the things that are opening up in Midtown now. The other restaurants and the, and the brewery, Zero Day Brewery opening up, it's, it's fantastic. It's good for Midtown, it's good for Harrisburg. Uh, and as long as you know, people are feeling safe coming into the city, they're going to have a lot of great options.
Beer tourism is integral. Uh, I think that beer draws people not only from its surrounding, you know, walking blocks, it brings people from other states. They're coming in, they're staying in our hotels, they're checking out our retail shopping opportunities, they're checking out our state capital and the museums, and it really is an influx into areas that may need it. And while Harrisburg has its struggles, and it has, you know, its issues, I think it's so superficial, and breweries allow people to come in for a beer and realize what beauty is underneath the headlines. Is the local market oversaturated, and do you think it will become so? I absolutely think that it is a burgeoning market right now. Uh, I do think distilleries are probably going to become more prevalent in the in the coming years. However, I don't think that you can have enough craft breweries. I think that you can have oversaturation in the distributor side of it. I don't think it's getting oversaturated yet. Um, Everybody that we know that I've seen so far seems to take their time. It doesn't seem like anybody's rushing that as locally, which is a good thing. I, I don't know about saturation. I mean, it, it's, it's, it's more that we're probably getting a bigger share um, in, in the beer world against uh, the bigger, bigger beer or whatever we want to call it, corporate beer. There's never too much beer. There's never too much beer. There's always something for someone, so... Yeah, can never have too much. You would think it'd be too much, but in my experience so far, the more the merrier. Back when Prohibition hit, there were like 2,000 breweries in the United States. Uh, population was like 115 million. Just back in 2012, it got back to the same number of breweries, but with over 300 million people. Um, so no, it's, it's not oversaturated. Um, people want to drink local, they want to stay local, they want to support local products. Look at Asheville, North Carolina, for example. Uh, we visited there and there are at that time, two years ago, 11 or 12 breweries or beer bars or bottle shops within walking distance of each other. We popped from one to the other. The streets were packed. There was great retail. It was a great community that was anchored by beer. And I think that we're working towards that in Harrisburg. There's people that are gonna rise to the top because everybody wants to try their beer first and then it's gonna filter out. Like those that aren't hacking it are gonna fade away and the, and the true really great beers and breweries are gonna stick around. I don't know if I'd call it oversaturated. I think there's gonna be like a, like a Darwinist survival of the fittest kind of thing, which I think is good. It's a great way to describe it. The ones that are making the quality product, that are interacting with their customers Building positively, the yeah. ones that have a good reputation, are going to last. The ones that are not making good beer or don't care about the quality of their beer, don't care about their customers, are not gonna make it, just like any other business. Everybody sort of does something a little bit different. Everybody sort of takes a niche and goes into their own style of market. So, you know, just because we, we do one thing, the new, next brewery that comes into the area might do t something totally different, which is cool because that's even more variety for our customers. There's different kind of types of breweries and, and I think it really ultimately depends on the expectation of who's running the brewery, you know, what, what they want to grow up and be. You know, there may be a point where maybe too many is too many, but I think in the meantime the, the industry is growing and uh, more and more people are being turned on to go visit their local brewery and see, see what's going on. Even though we, we have, including us now, three sizable breweries in the area and lots of small ones, I still think in this area in particular there's plenty of room to grow, 
plenty of room. Uh, more and more people in this area are just really getting into it. Sky's the limit. The oversaturation is going to happen, but it's going to be the big brands that are going to be pushed out. You know, just look at how much macro beer is sold. All of that represents somebody that can be educated on what they're drinking and can make the switch. And that's really what we want to focus on, not just catering to people who are already into craft beer, but you know, people like my dad who drank macro beer his whole life, and then he tasted one of the lighter beers that we make, and now he's getting into craft beer and learning about it. You know, I honestly don't think he knew there was more than that flavor of beer available. Um, but now that he sees the different colors, the different flavors, he wants to get into it. And you know, that's, that's awesome. There's a segment that's losing a lot. And if we look at that, that one little segment, and let's say it's just a giant bucket, and if you have a bunch of holes in that bucket, a lot of that volume that's moving out of that bucket is going into this craft bucket. There's definitely a shift going on. So I don't know if there's necessarily a saturation um, issue if we can still keep moving that needle and taking market share away from the macro beers. If it keeps going the way it is, I think we're fine because uh, it's kind of, I mean, we're, tur we're turning people every single day. <laughs> So if we continue to if we continue to turn people on to to the craft beer uh, as it is, which we which we have been, I I, don't, I, I think it's going to be a long time before it's oversaturated. As long as customers want to try new things, then we're all good. As long as the beer is always good, it won't ever oversaturate because I mean people will always drink. I, I, I think if you're going to be involved in beer, assuming you can make a good beer, uh, you, you've got, a, you've got a, a leg up because there seems to be an increasing market uh, demand for beer. I think it's really important to make a very good product and it's important to you know, market your beer to the crowd that, that'll buy it. The beer is important, doing, making good beer and you know, watching people smile when you're drinking your beer is important too. How can any place be oversaturated with beer? I mean, you know, it's beer. I always hesitated to get into home brewing because I always heard my friends that did it complain about how much time it took to bottle, so it always kind of held me back. So when I decided to do it, I decided I would start right out with kegging and it just makes it so much easier and it's been an awesome hobby. I enjoy it. There's people that kind of look at it, you know, it's just, it's like a hobby, which it is, but it becomes a passion for us that are doing it. I mean, I started out, made three and realized, I need new equipment, I need to move to all grain. And now you'll see my equipment, it's, it's borderline a pro nano system at this point and I have it in my shed with no aspiration to going pro. So it's, it's definitely something that you just keep feeding off of and you get addicted to. You can get carried away with home brewing, which is what I chose to do right from the get-go. Um, we're a good example of the different extremes. Uh, Tim started with extract on his stovetop, probably for 50 to $100. I started with this, which I designed and kind of built myself for about $1,200. So the main thing is you can brew good beer on any equipment, as long as it's clean and sanitary you're going to make good beer. You don't have to spend a ton of money. The equipment has changed just even over the past 10 years. It makes it a whole lot nicer to make awesome stuff whenever technology is finally caught up to what you want to do as your own brewer. I definitely know that home brewers these days have it easy. Uh, we have access, you know, Breskis and Scotts and Brothers. You can go in there and there's a cooler full of hops and they're all fresh. It's easier to get ingredients now. I mean, the, the internet's really changed how things work. You, you can get just about any type of ingredient, order it on a Wednesday and have it to your house by Friday and you're brewing Saturday. Home brewers in general are much more sophisticated than they used to be. I think they're, they're so much more available to them resource wise. The internet has been a fantastic resource for a lot of people. And home brewers in general are very willing to share. And there's a lot of homebrew clubs that sprung up over the years too. Homebrew clubs do a lot of different stuff. Um, you have different levels of uh, knowledge, basics, guys just starting out to advanced levels of guys that have pre, uh, you know, brewed professional beers. Um, the biggest thing I got out of it as a beginner to the meetings was I could bring a beer that might have been a little bit off and one of the more experienced guys could you know, sample it and tell me exactly or you know, close to what I did wrong. 
Um, that's the most important thing if you're going to try to, you know, change your recipe, modify it, make it better. If I'm trying to brew a beer that's similar to some type of commercial beer that I'm interested in, I will actually uh, contact the brewery and sometimes they're even very helpful with telling you what yeast they use or what grains they use. And if you can talk to a local brewer in the area, that helps a lot too. So yeah, I've been able to get uh, tips from uh, Terry at Pizza Boy, from some brewing friends I have in the Baltimore, uh, Washington area. Yeah, the relationship between home brewers and the, the pro craft brewers is very inclusive. Um, it seems like they're always reaching out to us. Um, some of them allow us to brew on their setups, and we take a lot away from that. You know, if you see my setup outside in the brew shed, a lot of that stuff came from brewing at ABC and Camp Hill or brewing with Terry Hallbaker out at Pizza Boy. Just seeing how the equipment works and saying, I can do that on a smaller scale with my gear and make it easier for me to do something or make my beer better because I'm changing the way I, I change my process. Yeah, I've been doing this on the weekends again. Now I have some time to brew my own beers again, do some, do some fun stuff. Uh, I've been rebrewing some of the originals that we, uh, that we brewed for Milbock. So I have a golden toast going at the moment. So just having fun, fun in general with, with the brewing. Do you guys want to try anything? Sure. <laughs> challenges about being a woman in the craft beer industry. It's getting better, definitely, um, but one of the biggest challenges is, oh, she's a woman, she doesn't know what she's talking about. And people say, oh, well, you don't drink this stuff. There's no way you could be drinking that double IPA or whatever. There's a lot of stereotypes that women don't drink craft beer and that women don't drink the super hoppy or the super sour beers. Um, we are out there. It's just a level of education and, and not necessarily schooling somebody or anything like that, but being able to kind of have a conversation and, you know, once you start that, especially with a super beer geek, you can geek out together, which is awesome. So it's just kind of nice to be able to talk to people in the field and show them that, yes, we are out there. Yes, we are drinking beer. And yes, we even might make beer too. Beer spans all genders, races, religions. It's not a specific demographic. When I first started writing Stouts and Stilettos, it, it wasn't that it, it wasn't well received, but when I would tell people about it, they, they just couldn't even fathom that a woman liked beer and a woman is writing about it and a woman is be trying to become, I don't want to say an authority, but a knowledgeable source on beer. But I think because craft beer is becoming more of an everyday thing, it's not as weird as a woman to like beer as maybe when I first started doing it and it would just, people were confused. <laughs> I think a lot of people do see craft beer, be craft beer drinkers as those geeky hipsters and all that sort of thing. And we're not geeky hipsters. Well, we're maybe a little geeky, but we're not hipsters. <laughs> we are not hipsters, no. no. But, I, and I think we can be ambassadors for the, the craft because there are a lot of people like us who who have the wrong image of craft beer or who don't know anything about it yet at all. The, the nature of the craft beer world matches great with the organic feel and the organic sort of word of mouth of social media. A lot of startups rely on that and you'll notice that a lot of the smaller breweries basically focus on getting the word out with Facebook and there are other social media channels that are popping up that are more actually niche in, in targeting a lot of the, the uh, craft beer world. I think I found out about a lot of things, not just new beer releases or what so-and-so is drinking, but just learning about beer in general from social media. Um, it's an important tool for all aspects of life at this point, but it's it's really a unique thing to be able to, you know, I can check my beer in and untapped and push it to Twitter and Facebook, and now we have a whole conversation about where did you find that, what did you think of it, um, you know, the whole experience behind it. I think, it's, I think social media is a game changer. I think the social media aspect is snowballing craft beer. 
We have this crazy society where we're all kind of following everyone else, all of us, with social media. And we're all, we see people checking into these places now and enjoying beer. And what more do we want than to go out and enjoy something? Social media is one of those disciplines that you can hit the ground running without a huge budget. And it really harkens back to the world of word of mouth. Opening a brewery, a small brewery, you have to tap into your networks, your friends, your family, and um, it's, a, it's, it's almost like it takes a village to raise a brewery. Any home brewer that's looking to go pro, just be ready to work for free. You know, try and befriend a local brewer and, you know, try and work on the side and just get a little bit of knowledge and get yourself in there. Learn from the bottom up, see every aspect you possibly can, and then decide what type of brewer you want to be. Um, and the other thing one brewmaster told me once is often when you come in from home brewing, you have your home brew recipes and they're very complicated and they're, they're really good from that standpoint. But as a brewer, um, the key is to learn individual ingredients and how they taste and smell apart from everything else. Start in a brewery doing anything you can. I mean, my first five years working in a brewery was serving, bartending, graphic design, all that, just being around it and then helping out on packaging days, just kind of you get your feet wet that way. There's also plenty of schooling available too, you know, but, but that only helps you to a certain point. Um, you know, the reality of brewing is, is different than theory, so don't, don't put all your eggs in one basket when it comes to school. Try and, try and do both if you can. If you're gonna do it, uh, do a lot of homework. Um, it, it's not like making a homebrew batch. You know, when you're making a five gallon batch of beer, it's not scalable, it's not, you know, you made it at five gallons, the hop utilization is different, the amount of grain you use is different, water chemistry is different. Those are the, the really big challenges. Um, once you make the beer and you make good beer, you have to sell it. And that's a whole nother animal in itself. That's another full-time job. That was probably one of the hardest parts just walking up to somebody and telling them, hey, I, I have great beer, you need to try this. Sometimes there's a misconception that a brewer is brewing beer, but a brewer is doing so much more than, cleaning. than just brewing beer. Right, they're cleaning, you know, they're fixing. It's, I mean, it's a constant, constant work in progress. The saying, I think, is it's 90% janitorial, 10% brewing. <laughs> uh, you come in very early in the morning and it's almost immediate you start cleaning uh, because sanitation and cleanliness is really the backbone of what makes a great beer. If you want to make it a profession, it takes a lot of time. It's not something you just do on the side and it happens. There's, there's money involved, there's time involved, uh, there's family members involved. Sometimes it seems like it's all fun and games. We're just back here smelling hops and looking at malt and drinking beer. It's not the case at all. It's a really high level of sacrifice, personally, that you have to make whenever you have a brewery or any business. If a home brewer wants to go pro and wants to make it his career, he really needs to find the capital to buy a fairly large system uh, to be able to serve the customers he needs, make a little bit of money, and not get himself burnt out by brewing you know, two times a day. Spend all your time on it. Like, don't do it the way that we did. Do it next to a, a full-time job. But if you're gonna do it, jump in it with, with both legs at the same time. Beer has been the last step in building a brewery. First step to build a brewery, get a lawyer. <laughs> Second step to building a brewery, make it a darn good business plan. Third step is finding the money. Fourth step is building it. And fifth step, is finally actually getting to make it. Any home brewer that's looking to go pro, don't. <laughs> uh, you'll, live, you'll live longer. Anyone looking to start up your own, your own brewery should eat shit. No, no. You looked at me so seriously. 
Anything else you want to say about beer in Harrisburg or craft beer in general? The more the better. Yeah, the more the better. Definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, I think I think everybody loves it. We keep shining that crystal ball trying to figure that yeah. one out. <laughs> we're very hopeful that, of course, we're going to see more people kind of turn to the craft side. It's becoming so prevalent that you now have um, folks who were not necessarily craft beer people originally that are getting involved. And so you'll see a very diverse portfolio of beers for the consumer. I love the diversity of, of what I see coming out of the marketplace. And, you know, it, it's just like anything, um, there's, there's always a place to get better. And when people come into the market and they become that better thing or that, that new adventurous thing, that's gonna help bring more people into our industry. And, and again, it just, it ends up being such a great thing for the future of craft beer. I think that we're gonna continue to see just this great renaissance of, uh, of local craft breweries coming onto the scene and doing some really cool stuff and really pushing the envelope of, of where beer is and where it's gonna be. Seeing a lot of places push push the envelope as far as uh, styles. Um, there's a lot of new styles that have come out the last couple years, black IPAs and, and such. Um, experimentation is, is on the forefront using ridiculous ingredients. I, nothing's off limits. Incorporating really cool programs like barrel aged stuff and, and uh, wild, wild uh, fermented things, you know, because they're they're able to do it because they're, they're given the support from the local community because we all love them. So if we're giving them the support and we're buying their beers, they should be able to expand and, and, and do, do cooler things. Just be creative. Just brew what you want to brew. You know, I wake up some days and I want some weird beer and I say, let's brew this. That's Spanish Dynamite is on tap right now. It's a, it's a jalapenos and limes pale ale, but it's fantastic. So we, just, we don't ever look at what everyone else is brewing. We brew what we want to brew. We want to be known as a brewery that that makes the standard true to style beers, but we also want to do a little bit of experimentation and, and be able to, to play and be creative and, and experiment. Everyone wants what's new and what's different. So keeping relevant would definitely trying to keep ahead of those trends and try and put out some really exciting and new styles of beer. Super big, hoppy, not super bitter, floral, you know, those, those beers are really hot right now. Um, Sure, sours, you know, are, are, are the next evolving taste, you know. When I first got here, what, two years ago, uh, we started making sour beers and they were not popular at all. No one really knew anything about it. And now I can't keep them around. Maybe in the future, you're not gonna see the, the brewers trying to get national re recognition. They're gonna be more focused in their home areas because there's going to be so many more of them, you're better off making a stand at home and just being an artist about what you're doing and not necessarily trying to get it all over the country. There's so many quaint small towns around here that could support local breweries and I really think it's just exploding in this place becoming a mecca, almost exactly like Asheville. In this region I see craft beer continuing to boom. I think you're going to see, uh, much like you, you see in, in a lot of European communities, you'll see breweries popping up in almost every little town, and they'll be uh, they'll be sustained by the local community. You know, in Germany and, and some European countries, you go into a bar and you order uh, Hefeweizen, and say, um, it's not even a question. They just give you the one that's brewed closest to that bar. Um, that'd be awesome if that happened here. You give someone choices it's going to make it so it's a destination. And that's what we wanted, and that's you know where the name Zero Day comes from. You know, It's, it's a, a hiking term where you don't log any miles. You usually only do that when you have a really cool place to, to check out. And we really want Harrisburg to be a zero day destination.
craft market has revived Harrisburg's 200 plus year history with beer, and there's no stopping in sight. New breweries, hot farms, and maltsters are expected to join Harrisburg's growing craft community in the coming year. As Deschutes Brewing Company's Gary Fish recently said, this is the greatest age of beer in the history of the world. Sorry, oh, are we doing this now? Oh, I thought we were still just hanging out. Sorry. <laughs> well, it's, it's, all, it's always, it's always. <laughs> That's pretty good size, though. I know. I don't, you might need a bigger camera. Look at you do. Hi, guys. Is this thing on? Is that, okay. Okay, I'm here, I'm focused. Where do I look? There's a lot of things happening. I'm like, Hi. <laughs> now I'm like. I know, right? So you don't want me to talk to the camera? <laughs> There's a big dead fly on the camera. That is not my face. Near. <laughs> Four. <laughs> Good thing this is being edited. Yeah. Okay, I have problem being home brewing for about. Eleven or twelve. Yeah. No. 10 years. <laughs> We're very fortunate here to have Terry. Terry is like a 20 year veteran. Does a very good job. I give him wedgies all the time. Oh. Weird, huh? Yeah. There's nothing hanging out of my nose. <laughs> so I say cut. <laughs> really? Question, huh? Oh man. I'll tell you what you want. Just let my family go. Oh, so bright. I'm kind of lost in the <laughs> lost in the question now. Yeah, you're good. Another one I would think about. I have I really have no answer for that, so I tried my best. I mean, I guess these are all questions I should be have already been prepared to answer, right? Um, so ask the question again. Oh, I don't, I'm not sure. <laughs> wow, you got me. <laughs> I don't know what I think. I just lost my alternate thought. Let me come back to you. Scratch that. <laughs> All right, this is one of the moments that I have to think really hard. Okay. Um, let me think about that for a minute. Um, what was the second half of the question? Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> By local, I feel like I had more there. <laughs> no, I just blanked. <laughs> what was the question I forgot already? No, that's a great question, I because literally on a daily basis. Oh my god, you get to drink all day! Should I refill beer? Are we going to be, am I going to be, are we talking like an hour? The hell, I don't know. <laughs> I'm just gonna do this the whole time. <laughs> Nate, before we start, I'm gonna have you pour me another beer. Excuse me, you've been able to scale up. That was grapefruit sculpting. <laughs> so don't put any of that at all in the movie.